then okay welcome everybody i'm gonna go ahead and jump into the presentation for the day um if you don't know me i know a lot of people here but not everybody um so nice to see your faces when i can um, my name is keto i coordinate our education programming for keep growing detroit um, along with one of my team members here miss lola um, Lola Gibsonberg, and she's great. Uh, she's going to be supporting me with uh, helping navigate the chat uh, today for the class. So uh, please channel your questions to the chat. Um, I'd love to open it up for discussion, or you know, if you have things on your mind in particular about gardening at this time of year, hopefully we'll answer some of those questions um, in the presentation. And if we don't, we can uh, answer those either in, you know uh, at the end. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and do a screen share here. Okay. And do this. Oops. No, not that. Present. And okay. So the topic for today is fall gardening. Um, so technically, fall started late September, but as I was mentioning earlier, we're really starting to feel that now. Um, but, you know, with in terms of the weather change, um, but, you know, as we, uh, as we know, you know, we are losing sunlight. Um, so that has a dramatic effect on our ability to grow things or the, the productiveness of our gardens. Doesn't mean we can't think, keep our, our gardens growing through, through most of the year, other, you know, there's a few techniques that we could be using to still be harvesting even in the cold months. Um, not everything, some things, but not all. Um, but this is just an image to reflect on just that, you know, we are at the time of the year when the sun lays lower in the sky. Um, so we get a lot more shadowing and a lot less sunlight. Um, so, you know, if you're in a spot in your, it, like where your garden is located, where shading is, uh, you know, more prevalent, you have buildings and bushes and trees and such, um, then, you know, you will have, you know, even less light than you would typically because of the way that the sun goes through the sky, as opposed to like during the, you know, the high sun of the summer months um, and the sun is high in the sky and we get the optimum sunlight uh, equaling optimum growth in the garden. So just reflecting on, you know, some of the basics of plant growth, um, the things that we have control over is the ability to keep a garden watered and how we can manage fertility in the soil. So those are always things to think about in, throughout the season and even going into the fall and some things that we could be doing to prepare the soil for next year. Uh, but in, you know, but the things we don't have control over um, are that uh, the temperatures are, you know, because we are getting into uh, the later season of the year and how the sun rotates around the earth, uh, we, ends up, we end up getting um, cooler days. Um, and then into the winter time, we, uh, we get to um, where it's, you know, plants are not actively growing after about, you know, the beginning of November. Um, so, you know, strategies here are thinking about what we can keep growing uh, un until that point or what we can have started and be harvesting during the winter months. And then those things that maybe it's, they're done. They're, you know, it's done for the season. Uh, how can we clean up the garden? How can we prepare the garden for the next year um, to, you know, just get us off on the good foot? Um, so uh, we have a bunch of ideas here to go through. It's uh, I would say not, by no means comprehensive. We covered a lot of stuff, but if you have um, any additions or ideas as I'm talking, please drop them in the chat uh, to share with the group. You know, it's always a, a great thing to bring all our minds together and share ideas that uh, we have about how we could go about um, doing things differently, um, continuous improvement. So a general overview of fall activities for the garden are um, considering the design. Uh, so if it was a new garden, uh, you tried some things out, you did the bed layouts in a certain way, you planted the crops in a certain orientation, 
you group these crops together or you spread them out. Uh, you planted some new perennials this year. Uh, you planted some bulbs. Um, you have some, you know, uh, or you have plans for things in the future. So it's a it's a time to kind of evaluate how things went for the year, um, and also uh, it's also a, a, a maybe an ideal time to start to prepare a new spot. You know, um, like say for instance, if you you know have your garden set up, um, but there's you know there's some open grass. Not right next door to the, the beds and you're thinking that you want to ex expand into and, and grow some some more stuff um, this would be a great time to mulch that heavily do some kind of lasagna gardens to kill that grass and the time we have and from now until the springtime could be enough to get you ready uh, to be able to be planting that by by you know by april when we really want to start getting our spring crops in the ground um or you could be digging, you know, or if you want to get more of a jump on it, you, this is a great time to also be digging that stuff and flipping over the facade and, and, uh, or using cardboard to kill the grass. There's, there's, there's many ways to do it. Um, planting in fall for, you know, at this time of year, planting is, can be a little bit of a gamble, as it says here. Um, you know, we're getting pretty late in the season and because the days are shorter plants are growing slower but there are a few things that you could plant now uh either for a harvest you know in the next month or month and a half uh or you know something like carrots you could plant right now um and get them to germinate and then mulch them really well with the intention of getting a harvest early in the spring so we'll we'll, we'll dig into that a little bit more as time goes on um, some deadheading and uh, just general cleanup in the garden, pulling old crops, planting garlic, which is clutch, 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 um, planting bulbs, splitting and planting perennials, and uh, preparing for indoor gardening. So we'll, we'll kind of go through these things more in depth. All right, so uh, let's see. How are we doing with the chat there? We're doing well. Um, no questions so far. There's one question that um, maybe we will touch on at the end. Okay. All right. So um, right here, I just want to spend a minute to talk about the concept of season extension because essentially planting at this time of year is 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 trying to play with the this idea. So you know we, you know traditionally conventionally have grow our vegetable gardens roughly between April and October. So many people are just saying by now, the garden's done, I'm not planting anything more. Um, but with the concept of season extension, um, using, uh, you know, growing a few particular types of crops, uh, being like rooting crops and leafing crops that either have a short growing, you know, they have a short days to harvest um, and they, they are known to be cold tolerant you can still keep some either keep crops growing that are you know still in the garden, or uh, plant some now and then you know like I was saying earlier something like the carrots if you could be planting, either you know for for a spring harvest. Um, the reference point for this is essentially we know that uh, plants to actively grow need at least ten hours of sunlight, and uh, the in our region of the the earth here, uh, daylight uh, or hours of sunlight dip below 10 hours around November 10th. So we, if we work backwards from that, we look at the days to harvest on our seed packets and we say, okay, I can, you know, try and grow this in that time frame. Um, you know, that, that could be possible. Um, after that, you know, those crops will, they wouldn't necessarily die. Um, but they'll they go into kind of a stasis they 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 uh they go into a, a, a situation where they're just not actively growing they they just stay about the same size it's like uh suspended animation kind of kind of thing um another piece of the puzzle here would be some kind of protection um it could be uh so a, a concept you know related to season extension would be protecting them with as something as simple as straw or mulch or um, 
you could, if you have raised beds, you could cover the raised beds with wind, you know, some old window sashes or some kind of cleared plastic if the stuff is small. Um, and that would give some protection. Or there's these things called quick hoops that we like to, we recommended that people try out, which is uh, the quick hoop is essentially uh, a bow or a hoop metal hoop that's about four feet wide and three and a half, four feet tall that you can stick in the ground over the beds. And if you do two or three of those over say a four, four by eight raised bed, for example, um, you could put a, a row cover with, or, or uh, some kind of plastic over that. And that also helps with protection. It's kind of like creating a little tent scenario around the plants. That doesn't help them from freezing, but it buffers from the intense wind and cold of the season. Um, and then heavy snow loads once we do get snow. Um, uh, so we do have um, uh, what's called a quick hoop bender, or this, little, this little bending jig that you can put electrical metal conduit into uh, to put over those beds uh, you know, for that purpose at our, our KGD farm. So if that's something that's interesting to use, we can help you make those quick hoops. You can also use uh, half inch C PVC uh, pla uh, 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 electrical conduit as well. So both of these things, the half inch conduit that the metal stuff that's called ENT would be in the electrical department of the hardware store. Also with the C PVC, that would be um, something you could find in the electrical section. And th those just readily bend and you can use those as little uh, uh, tent, tent poles um, if you'd like as well. Um, so, you know, running down a list of some of the crops that work well for the, these purposes, um, again, under the categories of leafing greens and rooting crops. Um, so examples, you know, like you see on the page here are lettuce and spinach and radishes, uh, turnips, particularly uh, salad turnips, like uh, there's some of the Japanese varieties like hakurai, they're little uh, white radishes, I'm sorry, right, white turnips that look the size of a radish. Um, the greens taste similar to cooking greens. The salad, the, the turnips themselves are, are uh, small uh, and they have a very mild uh, turnip flavor. They don't have that intense spiciness. So I personally like them a lot better. I'm not a big fan of that, that spiciness uh, of the turnip. Um, or uh, So let's see, other types of greens would be, uh, let's see, arugula. Uh, there's lots of different types of Asian greens that are great for salads. There's like uh, komatsuna and mabuna, and they're all uh, different colors, shapes, and sizes. They they range in flavor profile from tasting similar to lettuces to tasting some taste maybe slightly similar to like napa cabbage or like a like a almost like a, a iceberg lettuce. And then there's some that have a, more of a spicy mustardy flavor. Um, so there's a whole range there of of those Asian salad mixes. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about those, I highly recommend. Um, checking out some of the seed catalogs, Johnny Seeds or Fedco or High Mowing Seeds, they all have lots of different varieties of those. I expect that, uh, I guess I haven't seen the seed catalogs out yet for, two or for, for 2022, but I expect that they'll probably be out soon. And that's always fun, something to do during the winter months in thinking and planning for the next year. Um, so, um, Let's see, other things that we would think about planting at this time of the season would be um, perennials. Uh, this is actually a really great time of year to divide and, and plant perennials. So if you have, I'm gonna say herbaceous perennials are really good for, for dividing. Herbaceous means that like they die back to the ground. They're not woody at all. So like hostas, or daylilies, or uh, daisies, or um, there, the list goes on and on. I mean, there's all kinds of perennials that you could divide up if you wanted to have, you know, if you only had one plant this year and they did pretty well, you could split them up and maybe have a larger um, swath of a planting. Uh, it's also a great time of year 
for planting bulbs like tulips or daffodils or snowdrops or uh, any of those fun ones. Uh, you, can, you can see, you know, often find those at the big box stores or uh, you can order them from companies like White Flower Farm. Uh, they have all kinds of interesting varieties to, you know, to, to create interest and beauty in the, in the garden. Um, and amongst other things, um, uh, this is definitely the time of year to get your garlic planted. Um, if you haven't planted garlic before, uh, garlic is something that needs to be planted uh, by this time of year before the frost. Um, and then it would live in that spot. In the spring, it would leaf, leaf out into these nice kind of wide blade, long uh, grass type leaf. And then um, in, in late June or July, they'll send up a, a scape, a flower head that can be harvested and eaten. And then uh, you actually pull them on the ground um, by July, you know, by the end of July usually. Um, so for planting garlic, we want to plant them six to 12 inches apart. And that's kind of a personal preference. If you have good quality soil that you feel like is good, uh, you know, it, it is, seems to be relatively productive, then you can you know, plant them slightly closer together, more like six inches. If you feel like the fertility in your soil is not great, then maybe planting them slightly farther apart will get you a, a better harvest in the, in the next year. Um, how that's, that spacing definitely will affect the size of the bulbs. Like if you have things too densely planted, then they're going to be competing for real estate in the soil and uh, you might tend to have smaller bulbs uh, when you harvest next July. Um, but we're planting those uh, each, they we're planting cloves. So we're taking the, uh, the garlic head and breaking it up into the individual cloves and then uh, make sure that the point of the garlic is facing upwards. And then once it's planted, you uh, ideally would mulch that with straw um, to give it, uh, that helps keep weed pressure down. And it helps also buffer the freezing and thawing of the soil from pushing the, the garlic head, or I'm sorry, the garlic bulb out of the soil, um, you know, and undoing the work that you did. So mulching with straw, and then, um, and then you're more or less good to go. Uh, for your garlic. Uh, it just in, in terms of thinking about plant, planting your garden for next year, you know, sometimes it's like the whole garden is cleared out and you're, and you're like, okay, so it's all like a fresh slate and you're like, I'm going to plant my garlic right now. And you're, you have a lot of seed and you're excited and you plant a big, large area. Well, just remember that that is dedicated to garlic until July of next year. So no spring planting of collards, kales, and lettuces, no summer planting of tomatoes, eggplants, and peppers. That's got to be garlic for that entire time. So keep that in mind. Okay. Questions. How's everybody doing? Um, Great. We have, one, we have one question. Can uh, one use grass clippings and leaves instead of straw for your garlic? I would recommend grass clippings and leaves for putting your garden to bed. I would say straw, uh, I would say shredded leaves would be good, you know, a good alternative. Grass clippings, I wouldn't necessarily recommend so much. I think that I would reserve those for just putting on your other beds that you're putting to, you know, other garden beds that you're putting to bed for the winter. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it, you know, uh, Straw is not free, typically. Sometimes it is, sometimes you can find it, you know, if somebody's after like the Halloween season um, or if you, or, or after the you know, or, or Thanksgiving, um, you could go around to some of the stores that use that stuff for display and see if they wanna, you know, if they're, once they're done with it, before, instead of throwing it in the dumpster, if you could take it. Um, but there is, you know, I know that there are some vendors at the Eastern Market, for instance, that, that do have straw available. And you can also usually find it at, at the hardware store in compressed bales. Like I bought a compressed bale for like 15 bucks last year, and that works out pretty well. So if you can get a bale for five bucks, that's probably a good price. If it's 10 bucks, it's not a great price. 
Um, but if you don't want to spend money at all, then I would uh, use shredded leaves. So take uh, your garden leaves um, and uh, run your lawnmower over them to, to break them up a bit. And the reason for that is because if leaves are, if you're just putting leaves down, they can tend to mat, like they can kind of create this barrier that um, can prevent sprouting in the spring. It can kind of hinder the, the young uh, baby plant from poking through. Anything else? Well, yeah, a um, couple more questions. What's your opinion on um, non-GMO straw versus GMO straw? Someone was uh, wondering about recommendations for a source of non-GMO straw, but I'm, but I'm also wondering if uh, you have a preference for one or the other. Um, well, GMOs, genetically modified organisms, are the when farmers are using those, it's usually for um, it, it's a specific kind of you know varieties of crops. Like they do it for beets, for like sugar beets, for instance. It's not across the board. I don't know for sure, but I suspect I don't know why they would genetically modify straw. Straw is a byproduct of hay, which is grown for feeding horses. And there it's grown, like, I guess maybe the more, maybe the question you're trying to get at is, you know, organic versus non-organic um, straw would probably be more of a thing that to worry about. Um, you know, genetically, and, and again, like I, I doubt that if they're using it for food that they're applying lots of chemicals and pesticides on those things doesn't mean that they're not using any, any at all. Um, the short answer though, it, to yeah, any of those is like to find non-GMO or, or, or organic straw is probably gonna be a stretch and, and difficult to do. Um, if that's something of a concern for you that you don't wanna mess with it or, or um, if you don't know, then you don't want to use it, then, you know, you can use the, uh, you can use the shredded leaves as an alternative. Cool. Okay. Um, does the advice about garlic we plant in the fall, um, needing to be in the ground until July, does that also apply to carrots that we plant in the fall? No. Carrots, um, so, we can look at this any, and so most any vegetable that we're growing, we can always look at the seed, the days to harvest uh, as a general point of reference. So, you know, so carrots are typically 60 days to harvest. You know, we're playing a game here because of the day lengths getting shortener, shortened and they're going to be, you know, they're going into that uh, hibernation state kind of by, you know, by going into the winter months, but likely you would be harvesting those you know, March, April. Um, so it would be a, it would be a shorter window. Okay. And thoughts about using shredded paper or uh, using shredded paper as mulch and using burlap to put your garden to bed. Uh, shredded paper can work as a mulch, um, but I, my experience with it is that it's kind of, it just makes the garden kind of look trashy. Uh, if, if, if you think of like, you know, office paper that went through the shredder and it's like all this white, you know, like um, matted stuff and it, it ends up blowing around the garden. So it just looks like a bunch of garbage got thrown around. Um, doesn't mean it doesn't work. Uh, shredded brown paper maybe is slightly better. Some people will use cardboard um, for the same kind of effect to like, as a mulch, I wouldn't use it like, you know, we'll get to this a little bit more later, but we want to, if we can have some kind of protective layer over the soil, that's ideal. We want to, um, the soil is a living, you know, lots of in, is, soil is living and has in, in billions of organisms in it. And if we can, uh, give some protection to that, that helps you know, those organisms work in 
uh, in symphony with uh, the, the roots of the plants that we're growing. And so if we can create a situation where uh, it's a more beneficial or more uh, uh, inhabitable situation for them that makes them happier and ultimately makes our crops happier. So uh, the short answer is yes, you can use shredded paper. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it, but you know, in some circumstances it makes sense. I might lean towards cardboard as another alternative. Okay, anything else? Well, um, I think we can touch on the other questions towards the end. So yeah, okay. if other people just have general questions, feel free to throw them in the chat and we can, we can go through them at the end of the presentation. Okay. Okay. So uh, this is definitely like, this is probably gonna be a perfect weekend to do the garden cleanup if you got the time. This is, uh, you know, we've basically, we've gotten to the, for, you know, for, the, for a lot, for in particular for our hot crops, like if it doesn't have fruit on it now, then it won't, it like, you know, it's not really gonna have any more fruit. Like whatever is, Basically, what is ever is on those vines in the garden right now is the end of harvest for the season. And most all those things you could like tomatoes as a good example, like in the picture here, you can just pull those off the vine, even if they're green and uh, and pull them inside the house and ripe, either ripen them on your counter or put them in a paper bag or just, you know, use them as green tomatoes and fry them up or whatever, or make chow chow and all that kind of stuff. Um, but, uh, essentially now is the time of year to, you know, pull up all those things that are no longer producing, um, and then to consider the things that are still doing producing and, and what to do about those. And so let's try and get to, into that in detail. So like I had mentioned, um, hot crops are, you know, basically, um, going to be done. Uh, so anything that has a fruit on it. Uh, so just to go run down the list of it, it, squashes and peppers and tomatoes and eggplant, uh, all those things are, are more or less done. Um, it's highly recommended to remove any everything that you can from the soil. Um, and so, uh, and remove the uh, dirt from the roots and then compost that stuff. Um, and the concept there is that uh, there are, there, you know, a lot of times there can be pests that will harbor in the dead plant matter or in the, you know, in the, in the plants. And so they'll, they could, they, if, if they're not kind of, if those plants aren't dealt with, that could provide, a, a, you know, an issue with, um, you know, overwintering a habitat for pests for that to cause more problems next year. Um, uh, when you are pulling this stuff up, um, I, I would say you know, the I, uh, a, a way that's going to save you some work down the road, a little work on the front end is to cut that stuff up into short lengths uh, to compost it. Like if you pull out a whole long tomato vine, you just throw it in your compost pile. And then you come back a few months later and you're like, okay, I got to turn this compost pile. And you try and turn that pile with that big long vine tangled in it. Um, it's a real pain in the butt. So if you cut things up into two, three foot sections or, or shorter um, before you put it in the pile, it just makes it a lot easier to, um, to deal with that. Or maybe you don't have a compost pile and, and you just put your stuff out um, for bulk pickup. I don't remember when is the last bulk pickup? Are we still doing? Are we still getting uh, bulk curbside pickup for City of Detroit at this time? I think so. I you know it ends at some point. So if it hasn't ended, then you know you still have a window, but I, it will end um, before too long uh, as we get into the colder months. So it's something to uh, to check in on. Um, let's see. Uh, as a point of reference, um, the average last frost date in Detroit is, or I'm sorry, the average first frost date is October 23rd. So for sure, you want to get out there before frost to get any of those tender things. Um, 
And that includes things like sweet potatoes that uh, even though they're, you know, technically a potato that's in the ground, they, they do not like cold weather at all. They do not respond well. And it can actually, even if um, the roots are intact, it can affect the quality of the flavor of the, of the sweet potatoes. Um, so you, this would definitely be a good time to, to pull those up and both, you know, and you might want to both with, uh, with, with the winter squashes, um, like the delicatas and the hubbards and such and sweet potatoes, ideally you want to, uh, cure them, put them in, um, a relatively warm, uh, environment for about 10 days. And that really helps the sugars develop. And it also helps uh, it, uh, the curing helps them store better. So it like it helps the outside skin on the sweet potatoes and, and the, the shell of sorts on the outside of the uh, squash to, you know, thicken and, and cure to uh, make, make it much easier um, to, you know, store those for several months. Um, and then, you know, just a general reference here uh, that um, another reason to, to clean up the garden at the end of the year is just to keep in line with the city ordinance and avoid any kind of blight tickets. Um, so according to the city ordinance, dead garden plants must be removed. Um, and in any instance, no later than November 30th of each year. So if you have a forward facing garden, um, you know, maybe your garden isn't necessarily next to your house or like, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's away from where you live, uh, you know, try and clean it up and, and make it look presentable. That does reflect on, on the rest of us gardeners across the city where, you know, we're trying to be good neighbors uh, and, uh, and, you know, just help everybody. Nobody wants to look at, at you know, at uh, piles of debris and, and kind of rough shot looking garden. So tidying up is a is a helpful and ideal thing to do. Um, and then lastly, on this page, just a reference that uh, there are some things that we could be um, saving seed from at this time of year, some of which, you know, needs a little bit of planning, but um, we're not going to dive too deep on seed saving. But just to say for a really good example, and one of the best things to, you know, if you haven't saved seed before, to try saving seed from would be tomatoes. Um, and that's a, a super simple process that I'm going to summarize real quick here. So essentially, um, you know, tomatoes, uh, well, it's, an it's actually a really interesting thing I'm going to kind of like talk about for a second. So if you think about it, seeds, you know, how we get seeds to grow is we put them in water, right? Like we put a seed in, we, if we have a seed in a seed packet, the seed doesn't grow on its own and, and it, it once you introduce water to it, then it germinates and it starts to grow. So why doesn't a seed in a tomato, you know, tomatoes are full of water. They're full of like, why don't they grow? Why don't they sprout? Well, there's this, uh, they have this chemical that I can't think of, this natural occurring chemical. I can't think of the name of right now, but essentially the I, what it does is it prevents the, the seeds from germinating, this, this, uh, this ingredient, uh, this natural ingredient in the tomato. So what we do is we're gonna cut off the bottom of a tomato and then we squeeze out all the juices and the seeds into a container. And then we put that uh, with a lid on it and we let it mold for a few days. Sounds you know, kind of counterintuitive, but what we're doing is when that, when that mold is, when it's that molding happens, that breaks down uh, that uh, anti-germination stuff. Uh, to make the seeds viable for growing. So we do that three to four days, you know, get some nice, you know, brown, ugly gray mold on it. And then we take put, and then we take that, you pour it into a strainer, rinse it off really well, wa wash off the seeds, put those on a cookie sheet or a piece of wax paper and let them dry out. And essentially you got seeds for next year. If you want to, if you have enough of them, uh, maybe count 10 of them and and soak them in a, uh, put them in a, a paper napkin and soak that and you can um, wait three or four days and, and you can do a germination test to see what, what how, how good the, the germination rate is on them. So if you did 10 seeds then, and uh, nine of them germinated, then you have a really good germination rate. If only three of them 
germinated, then you, you know, the germination rate isn't great. And so that helps you, you know, plan for, for moving ahead. Um, so uh, seed saving is fun. I would definitely encourage people to explore it. Um, and they're, you know, uh, as, as, uh, as, you know, one of the great things about gardening. You know, <clears throat> quick yeah. question about um, seed saving. Can you save the seeds from green tomatoes or do they need to be ripe? They need to be ripe. And that goes for every, and you know, we didn't get into, I wasn't diving in too deep on that, but that goes for any fruit that you're saving seeds from. So like for ex example, cucumbers, um, when we eat cucumbers, we eat the immature fruit. Like, I don't know if you ever had a cucumber that stayed on the vine too long and it starts getting yellow and the skin gets tough. That's where, you know, that's the point where the, the fruit is actually maturing. Uh, and that's when you would save the seed from the cucumber, for example. So, um, okay. Any other questions? Mm, not at the moment. Okay, so some things you can kind of keep going in the garden. Um, lots of greens, the collards, uh, kale, uh, chard, some of the like scallions usually are pretty cold tolerant. Um, so if you have those things growing in your garden, it's really a, a kind of a, a choice point at this time of the season on do you just harvest everything that's off of it or, uh, and then, you know, call it a day, or do you keep it going? You know, I guess my general recommendation, particularly like a lot of people grow like for, for like collards, like it's a, it's a, it's a tradition for folks to, you know, harvest collards for Thanksgiving dinner. And usually that um, would be after the frost date. So uh, uh, frost, like if we get any kind of frost on collards and kale, spinach, any greens that get a little bit of frost on them and that can still take it and still go, uh, still keep living. Um, those, you know, three being good examples, um, they become sweeter. Um, there's this natural effect of the plant anticipating the cold pulls the more sugars out of the soil into the leaves and the sugars act as a antifreeze. Uh, and we get the benefit of that after a nice freezing. Um, so, and in some cases, if we have a mild winter, um, the collards and kale as, as two of the, you know, kind of biggest examples of this will survive all, you know, all through the winter. But the downside of that is like, if you know that you have really bad flea beetle problems, for instance, like if you have, cause flea beetles are a really, uh, annoying, uh, pest that can persist season after season. If you know that you got a pretty bad flea beetle problem, maybe it's a good idea to pull those plants up uh, sooner than later because they definitely can harbor, you know, like I was talking about earlier, they can harbor in, in the, the plant debris um, and cause more problems down the line. Um, so let's see. Oh, Keto, quick question. What's a sign of flea beetles? Flea beetles, uh, flea beetle damage looks like buckshot. It looks like lots of tiny little holes in the leaves. Um, that's the name. That's what they look like. And they, 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 if you, you may, you know, if you're inspecting your garden, which I highly recommend you do, you know, walking through your garden on, on a regular basis um, is a really great way to learn stuff about you know what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong and trying different stuff and learning from it but essentially if you're walking through your garden and you see you can uh you can if you don't if you're gonna you know, gingerly walk up to plants you can oftentimes see the flea beetles it looks like a little they're a little black dot and um if you haven't encountered them yet um I, i'm happy for you um because they're they're an annoying little pest and they're hard to keep in check. There, there's not really any kind of uh, treatment that you can do to get rid of them because they're hard-bodied insects. So they're, they're pretty tough little buggers. Um, but yeah, that's that. Um, other maintenance things that we uh, should be doing at this time of year um, is in the perennial gardens, 
um, cutting back uh, non-woody uh, leaf material. And this is another like, in some cases people, it, it depends on the perennials, like some things people always cut back, some people's, you know, some, like if they have any kind of win, you know, winter interest, people will leave them up, particularly like things like uh, echinacea um, and to some degree, I guess sunflower heads, um, they, that can provide uh, food for wildlife during the winter is not a bad idea to leave out. You know, uh, those guys are part of our um, garden ecosystem. And if we can encourage them, you know, a, a really diverse ecosystem in the garden, um, that really is a great strategy for encouraging pollination and discouraging uh, pest pressures. So the idea there is that, you know, get as many people, you know, kind of have a really diverse uh, populations of different kinds of insects and no, and no one will, you know, will particularly dominate the situation. And oftentimes there will be parasitizers or ones that can, you know, one kind of bug will eat another kind of bug. And that's a, you know, it just, uh, it's a really wonderful ecosystem. Um, and so leaving some of these plant, you know, these, these leaves and, and plants uh, up, particularly if they look nice, um, is, uh, is a benefit to those guys. Some things just look trashy and it's probably time to clean them up and it's uh, um, not a bad idea to do. Um, uh, there's just some talk here about things that are self-seeding. It's pretty late in the season, but they're, you know, just for, for reference for the future, um, you know, a lot of these things, arugula and calendula, chamomile, cilantro, they all, if you leave them go to seed, um, and then they will readily, uh, um, some of that seed will get kind of spread around the garden and you will get volunteers for future seasons. Um, it, you know, it's a, a volunteer is a term where um, basically the seeds of, a, of the previous year's plants were left to mature and those seeds drop to the soil. And then the following season, they pop up uh, on their own. And that, you know, it's like a little gift um, and you can maybe move those around, you know, oftentimes, in my garden at home, we'll find, uh, you know, some of, uh, some, uh, I'm not thinking of a good name. What, what, what's a good example? We'll definitely find dill. We find dill all over the garden. Um, and there's a few of the different flowers, uh, perennial flowers that we have will pop up in different parts of the garden. So we'll save those throws in a little pot or transplant them right away to a new part of the garden. And it, you know, it kind of helps, you know, fill out the spaces and, um, uh, it doesn't, it's not a whole lot of work. So that's a, it's a really nice uh, strategy. How are we doing Lola? Any questions on this one before I move on? Um, I think we're good on this one. Okay. Um, so getting towards wrapping things up and I've talked about this a little bit, but just to talk, you know, a little bit more in detail about, um, you know, basically covering the soil is a really important step. Uh, I highly, highly recommend that you cover your soil as much as possible during the winter. Um, erosion is a thing. Um, it, I would definitely, I mean, even if you want to do your own test to like learn for yourself, this is a really, um, this, you know, is a really powerful, way to see how much it impacts the soil is to if you leave one garden bed uncovered for the entire winter and then you mulch the other one really well with leaves and you come out next spring the one the uncovered bed will tend to be more compacted so you got to do more to prep the soil in the spring and kind of lifeless like if you dig into it you won't see many of the like larger arthropods like worms and such in the top layer but if you peel back those leaves, you'll often, you know, you'll see the movement of all those bugs and plants that have, have used that as a, uh, as a place uh, to keep, you know, keep the soil living during those winter months. So um, mulching, 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 mulching. To, you know, use the mulch, mulch is great. Um, but when I say mulch in particular, I'm talking about the biggest thing I wanna encourage is leaves or straw, leaves or straw. Wood chips in your garden bed, 
it can work, but they take a long time to break down. So it could be annoying when you're trying to plant um, small seeds next spring and you got these chunks of wood that are sticking in, in and out around your soil. You want things that are, you know, they don't have as so much carbon in them and they break down. Ultimately, the wood chips will break down in the soil and it's, and it's a win-win. Ultimately, it'll take, you know, just take a lot longer. Um, we talked about cutting plants into smaller sizes. Definitely, if the, you have any kind of disease issues, um, any kind of uh, blight or um, particularly intense pest pressures, try and remove those things from the site, you know, try and get those in the curbside bags um, as, a, as, a, as an alternative to the compost pile. Um, definitely would recommend at this time of year also stockpiling leaves as a, as a tool for the garden. Um, my, my neighbor and I often have competitions for who can get the most bags from the curb. So, you know, basically you could just go drive around your neighborhood and when people are bagging their leaves, like we're, we're not quite there yet um, with this season, but you know, it, they're definitely starting to fall um, and having those leaves on hand um, for, the, for adding to your compost for the next year or putting your garden to bed, they can serve a lot of purposes. If you have a, you know, ultimately, I guess you have to have a place to keep them in the meantime, but they can sack neatly in, in a back corner of the garden without much too, you know, too much trouble. Uh, okay, I think I'm good with this one. All right, now, so let's come back. Uh, let's come back to that question from the beginning of the class. So I want to hear people's, you know, what think about your your garden from this year. I want to think. I want you to say um, either in the chat. Uh, I want you to put it in the chat. Can everybody, you know, everybody who had a garden this year, if you could please put in the chat one thing that you grew too much of this year, and one thing that you grew not enough of. Um, earlier folks were saying that they didn't get the tomatoes that they wanted. Oh, but then other folks were saying they had too many tomatoes. Um, more spinach, more greens. Um, some successes included tomatoes, snow peas, lettuces, garlic, and scallions and some learnings included spinach, cabbage, carrots, and radishes. Lots of cherry tomatoes, yes. Some challenges also included uh, battling the local wildlife, uh, like rabbits, squirrels, and deer. Okay. So all this to say that this is the perfect time to plan your garden for next year. You have a point of reference for what you grew and the area amount of area that you had to grow in this year. Um, so take a notebook, go out in the garden and, and write, you know, next year or this year I grew three tomato plants and I didn't have enough tomatoes. So next year I'm going to write five. And then you have, when you're getting ready to pick up your GRP stuff next year, you know what you got to do, you know? Um, and so, and you know, ideally when we plant our gardens, we're thinking about succession. We're not just thinking about planting at once at the beginning of the year and that's it for the season. Ideally we're thinking about, well, okay, these are the first things I'm going to plant in the spring. And then some of those will be done. And then I'm going to plant um, the hot crops after those. And then when some of the hot crops uh, start to wane, then I can plant another, you know, round of fall crops and maybe even get a late, late season garden growing. The other piece of the puzzle is um, sometimes when you, you have too much at one time, you can resolve that by planting successions, particularly if you're growing seeds. Like if you like beans, but you don't want a ton of beans, then plant 
three or four bean plants and then two weeks later plant another two or three and the idea is that you would you know when the first st first ones start to come on uh, you get you know enough harvest for what you can use immediately and then um and then a few weeks later those that second round will come on um so succession is another another way to to think about planning but um you know, and there are many different ways to plan the garden. I think one of the easiest is to draw a simple map. Um, so like if you have four raised beds, uh, draw four rectangles and um, kind of sketch out what's gonna go in each of them. And then reference, you know, are, it, do you have enough space for that many plants? Um, and uh, so, all that to say, like I do this, I definitely do this every fall uh, with with my home garden. My wife and I, you know, think that through. I think it's really useful, um, and uh, sometimes, you know, when you're especially if you're brand new to gardening, it's a total gamble, and you don't know how things how big things are going to get. Um, and so, once you have that, at least you know a year under your belt. The other, you know, the other kind of useful tool like I was mentioning earlier for knowing how much you can grow is um, just spending time out there and, and seeing uh, like, you might notice that uh, these eggplants did really great. They're taller, they're, they're much more robust. And then this one I had tucked over in the corner behind the, uh, behind the greens didn't was, was stunted. And so you can start to learn that like, the, that is a lesson in spacing and a light, a lesson in access to, to sunlight. Um, you know, oftentimes we're either starting seeds or we're starting these small plants and we need to know how to manage, essentially manage their access to the sunlight um, is gonna affect how big things can grow. And when we're dealing with small scale gardens, it's often, you know, hard to escape wanting to plant more stuff because you, there's so many things we could be planting and we just want to, we just need more space. And well, why not just poke one more in and that one more that you poked in might be just rear run if, if you just don't have the space and the sunlight for that. Um, we talked about starting new areas a little bit earlier in the session, but again, uh, this is a good, really good image of what like setting up a lasagna new bed would be is putting down some cardboard to smother the grass and layering that with leaves and soil and compost. Um, and then also just if, if, uh, if you haven't gotten a soil test with us yet, um, you know, we encourage people to know the soil that they're working with, um, particularly for safety from uh, contaminants such as lead, but it also is a really good point of reference for what the fertility of your soil is, which is going to, you know, in effect, give you a sense of like how well your garden is going to grow. Um, and you can test again, you know, we give one free soil test from, you know, through the garden resource program, but if you want to do another one down the road, like say you've been adding compost every year and you want to get a sense of, um, you know, what your, foil, your fertility, how it's changed over time, then you can, you know, easily pay for another test uh, in a few years um, to learn from that process. For other things in the garden to be considering is just general cleanup and putting things away for the season. Um, you know, any kind of clay or uh, ceramic pots can either be uh, like either remove the soil and invert them or, uh, or cover them, bring them inside or cover them for the season. Uh, it just a recommendation is to not leave them um, top side up especially with soil in them, because with the fr freezing and thawing during the winter months, um, you can, you know, they'll, they'll get cracked and break broken down over time. So if you want to keep those going. Um, and then related to that, you know, if you're using containers or pots, usually, you know, people are, are using potting mix in those. Um, and you can reuse potting mix. Um, usually you want to kind of uh, reinvigorate it with some compost in the next season. But what I usually do is either in a garbage can or just in a pile in the back of my garden, I'll empty all the pots with the potting mix um, and either mix some, a little bit of shredded leaves with it 
Um, and either add some compost then or in the spring when I go to that pile again to refill the pots. But I've incorporated some shredded leaves and some compost and things to, to give it some new life in that and you know, so you can reuse that uh, potting mix year after year. Because we're not really, you know, we're not really wanting to use garden soil in pots because it uh, tends to be really heavy and compact and not have enough air space for the roots of the plants. So that's that's uh, something that we want to use potting mix as an alternative. Uh, for trees and shrubs, I mean, generally speaking, you know, any kind of pruning that you're doing is mostly aesthetic. If you have broken branches um, or, um, or dead branches or, um, a little bit of maintenance pruning you can do, you know, something is in the way, but the general recommendation for pruning trees and shrubs uh, for fruit and for landscape um, is to do it in the springtime. Um, you know, if you think about it, when you prune things, you know, it's a woody branch, it's an open wound and you uh, want that plant to have time to recover, to to heal over, you know, to create that skin on the end of it. So, um, you know, to heal over that wound, that cut. And, you know, if you're doing that now in this time of the season, the plant, the juices, their xylem and phloem isn't flowing and they're not doing any of that kind of repair work internally. So that would be more of a early in the springtime thing. And so leading into when, you know, the plant is super actively growing by summer months and they're just kicking out leaves and branches left and right. Um, you can, uh, you know, you can use rake leaves around trees as a, as a mulch, um, and which works great. Um, you can definitely use any kind of leaves as mulch on, on, on garden beds. Um, just be sure to, you know, one exact one, uh, idea is to you throw some soil on top of it to help prevent them from blowing around too much. Um, and then uh, getting into composting, we talked about this a bit as I've been going along, but managing a compost pile, it's a good time of year um, to give it a final turn uh, to maybe, um, you know, any of that, you're bringing lots of uh, plant material out of the garden. So to get a nice pile cooking with all this uh, debris that you you've just taken off of, of the end of the year um, cleanup and get that in a nice working compost pile um, so you know by springtime you can turn it again and start to have a product to be putting down in your garden and the concept of doing that uh, you know the general concept of, com of composting is you know combining browns and greens so browns being things that are high in carbon like leaves and straw um, and that are generally, you know, stable and greens, which are higher in nitrogen, like anything that's, uh, you know, um, uh, like grass clippings and the leaf material from your vegetable plants and such. Um, and trying to get those in either, you know, two to one brown to green ratio or a one to one ratio. Um, but one of the biggest pieces of, of composting is just creating a pile that's big enough to, to really get all those microorganisms and macroorganisms working and, and getting it to heat up and to break down. And so uh, getting a large enough pile. So you wanted to get it up to a, a decent, um, to, if you wanted to get it actively, you know, decomposing, get it to the size of a three by three by three or about the size of a washing machine, a pile. Be sure you're adding water as you're doing that. Um, you know, soaking the material with water is a good way to do that. Uh, and that's a good way to get it off to a good start, you know, to get those, all that microbial activity, all that, uh, you know, microorganism activity going to break that stuff down. And you'll notice, you know, if it's really going good, it'll reduce in size to about a third of that. And then once you dig through that, you'll start to see that dark, you know, that dark earth, uh, black earth, that's the, the product of compost. Um, you know, definitely do not want to be putting any kind of weed seeds into your uh, compost pile. So as you're doing cleanups, 
if uh, you're, you know, generally speaking, we're trying to pull up weeds before they get to that level of maturity uh, and, and not having to deal with any kind of uh, weeds, you know, reintroducing weed seeds into the garden. But if you are doing cleanups, you know, cut off those heads and throw those in the garbage or remove those in a, into a separate place. Quick question about compost keto. Do black plastic bags help? Um, Lisa is sharing that her granny would then bury them. Like putting it all in a black plastic bag and burying it? Yeah, Lisa could, yeah, she said yes. Um, so essentially what you're doing there is uh, it's probably out of convenience to, you know, black plastic bag is, you know, you can just throw all your scraps in there and then tie it up. And then, you don't if you don't want to deal with a pile, you know, dig a hole and put it in the ground and it'll decompose in the bag. Um, you could just as easily dig a hole in the ground. And if you're just trying to like manage your garden scraps or your, your kitchen scraps, um, uh, you can just dig a hole and bury the stuff and that'll serve a similar effect. Uh, the bag I think is, you know, it sounds like it worked for your grandma, so it's not the worst idea, but I don't know if you necessarily need it. Anybody else? Um, well, also you probably don't want to, very plastic right well right and you wouldn't i mean would you be digging the question is did she dig it up and then reuse use the compost later or was that just like to get rid of the stuff um oh yeah she reused it then later yeah um we got a couple questions but i think we will i'll tack them onto my list for questions to go over at the end. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna put a, an emphasis on this one because, you know, it's hard to find time to like take care of your tools. You know, your tools are your tools. Like they're just supposed to be there when you need them. And, uh, and then you just throw them in your shed and you don't think about them till the next time. But a little bit of TLC can go a long way. I mean, most of the tools that we have can literally last a lifetime if they're well taken care of. So a few tips on how to go about doing that is, um, is oiling wood handles using uh, linseed oil or you know any of the, like you could probably use Thompson's water seal or whatever, sanding them down a little bit, putting some oil on them. Um, Sharpening pruners and loppers is a huge thing like that makes like, you know, in terms of the experience of using tools, like using a nice sharp pair of pruners versus some dull ones is a dream. Um, and so taking care of those and doing a little bit of sharpening is not a bad thing. Um, uh, agri like bringing all your tools together and just putting them away, either in a shed or, um, you know, under a tarp in the garden or, you know, someplace protected from all the elements if you leave your tools outside all the time, you know, rust and, and just the wear and tear of rain and, and sun and all that uh, will, you know, will damage tools over time and they'll basically, you know, ultimately be trash if we don't take care of them. So I'm saying this outwardly as well as inwardly, like let's, you know, maybe take a few minutes and clean up our tools because um, I know that I got to do some of that for my fall cleanup this year. A um, few little reminder things is uh, shutting off the spigots uh, for the outdoor. To, um, so for your outdoor hoses, um, uh, turning off uh, the shutoff um, and doing and, and uh, undoing the drain on that should that should be standard in most households. I know that one of mine doesn't do that, but um, if you don't want to have issues with bursting pipes or freezing lines, um, definitely a good idea. They do have these insulator things that go over the like there that you can get from the big box stores that like it's a, like a styrofoam like plastic thing that slides over the top of your outdoor spigot that you that that can serve a similar purpose 
if it works for your, you know, like if it works for the way that your spigot is set up, it doesn't work at my house, but it is an option. Um, definitely taking hoses down and um, storing them either, you know, not without water in them is the, is the big thing. Cause if there's water kept in the hoses, freezing and thawing can, um, can burst the lines or, or ruin the hoses over time. Um, so wrapping and storing hoses is a good idea. Um, wire brushing, you know, hand tools, uh, all the dirt and rust and such off with uh, uh, of, of uh, the blades of tools is a good idea as well. Okay, and then, you know, as we're kind of done with the cleanup, you know, thinking ahead to um, some things that we could either be pulling indoors um, or just things, you know, related to doing it gardening indoors. Uh, here's a few things to uh, to reference. Definitely digging out bulbs. Um, if you have, you know, gladiolas or uh, cow lilies, dahlias, um, those uh, tender bulbs that can't handle the freezing, um, you can dig those up. Um, usually you want to dry them off. Uh, so dig them up, lay them out. To, to dry a little bit and then put them in uh, some paper bags with um, some like perlite or vermiculite or um, in, a, in a burlap bag or something like that. And that will, and then you can store those in your basement is probably the most ideal situation, not a garage. You don't want them to freeze. You want them to be in like a 50 degree, relatively dry environment and most of those will hang on pretty nicely in that situation could be a plastic tub um and then consider setting up you know you know a little indoor garden uh, growing things like lettuce and sprouts um so you can some of these things that you know uh we can't quite grow uh, a mature tomato plant under grow lights indoors um, without a whole lot of effort but you can grow these things that are have uh are intended to be harvested in their in the young stage of their life development. So like sprouts, sunflower sprouts, um, baby leaf salad greens, arugula, um, you can do radish sprouts, any of the sprouts um, work really well for this. Um, and, you know, you can uh, definitely do this with pretty simple setup, some trays, soil mix, um, uh, and then planting pretty densely um, with the intention of harvesting, like in this case, lettuces, uh, in, like in the picture here, three or four inches tall. Um, and that is what I have for slides today. So let's open it up for questions. Cool. Um, so first, are you going to be, I know we'll be posting this recording to our YouTube channel, uh -huh. um, but will you also be sharing the slides? I can do that. Okay. Cool. Um, so earlier on, someone was uh, sharing that they had their first crop from two apple trees this year and are looking for some direction to keep insects, bees, um, insects and bees away without pesticides, organic methods for doing so. Okay. Perennial fruit management, tree fruit management is, is tricky. Uh, pest management is tricky. Um, so I think you're probably referring to wasps not bees. Honeybees are, are, most bees aren't interested. The only time that they're interested in fruit trees is in the springtime when they're going around to flowers and collecting nectar. Um, wasps are omnivores. So they are, they will eat anything from, you know, the hot dog that you left out to, uh, to that rotting apple on the floor, on the ground beneath your, your apple tree. Um, so they're, they're more mostly opportunists. Um, so one strategy like for a heavily fruited apple tree would be to just stay on top of cleaning up the, 
you know, the fruit that has fallen and is not, is no longer viable and removing that from the situation, composting it or whatever. Um, other, I mean, there's, there's a number of different pest issues that apples may face. Um, and they're, and, and the, the short answer is they're, they're, it's a finicky way to, to do pest management because you, you have to pay attention to degree days and, and the life cycle of that particular pest. And you have to know what the pest that you're working with. So um, all that to say is I could refer a few resources if you're really excited about that. There's a great book called The Apple Grower. And there's also another great book called uh, The Backyard Orchardist. Um, and if you are dealing with a particular pest that you think is a big problem, you can, the first step is to identify what the pest is and then you can look up the, you know, some different strategies to deal with that pest. But, um, you know, there are, you know, you can also just, just kind of accept it. You can not do much with apple trees, you know, main, do make sure they're getting some good, uh, you know, adequate water at, at dry times of the season and do a good pruning in the spring and maybe think about the fertility, you know, once a year or something. And if you kind of do those, some simple maintenance things and just accept, well, this is the, you know, this is the harvest that I'm going to get. It's a lot less work. Um, and, you know, I've seen a lot of, you know, it's been a pretty good year for apple trees. I've seen a lot of what, like unmaintained trees that are loaded down. Like yeah. there's a tree next to my, you know, my, my little girl's school that always gets pretty loaded down. Uh, I was just over on uh, by the by the welcome center off of Bagley down by the bridge and there's this little park next to the repair the world, world building there's this little fenced in park and there's this loaded down tree there's a, a bunch of spots there's one on Trumbull by my house I mean you can drive around the city and find feral apples right now pretty easily uh, some really great stuff and hey that's actually one more thing you could be doing during the fall is driving around the city and looking for those you know if you know those three or four trees like we've We've probably picked up just by going on walks in our neighborhood and stuff, you know, picked up a couple bushels just from here and there grabbing, you know, because nobody else is, you know, got to get them where they're hot. Um, but that's what I got to say about apple trees. Uh, unfortunately, pest management is, is finicky. Cool. Um, we have a question about planting ginger and if you can... Uh, planting ginger over the winter and native plants. Okay, so two separate things. Ginger, um, ginger can be grown here in Michigan. Um, it is definitely a tropical plant or subtropical plant. Um, and we have been growing it at the KGD farm for the past couple years. We've been getting seed ginger, which is basically the same, you know, same ginger that we eat, uh, but it's organic and everything. Um, we've been getting it from the biker dude in, in Hawaii. So if you look up biker dude ginger, it's actually a pretty entertaining website, but they have really nice quality seed. They usually have, so you can, but you know, to grow ginger, it would be, you need to put it in a warm environment. Um, so we put it on heat mats or in our, in our germination chamber at the farm starting in February um, and to get it to sprout. And then, you know, if you did, and then we're planting it in one of our hoop houses. So it has that protection and, and some more warmth. Um, but on a home scale, you could put it, put it in a planter in a really sunny window and then as soon as, and then after last frost date, you can start to bring it outside. Um, and all that goes well, you could have, you know, like from one seed, you could get a, a baby a half a pound or a pound, maybe a pound isn't exaggerated, maybe a half pound you would get from a seed. Um, uh, I don't think it's like, I've heard people talking about trying to start, uh, instead of ordering from a seed company like like biker dude uh from trying to do it just from organic ginger um i don't think that's a terrible idea i think that's worth experimenting with 
Um, like I play, I've heard like places like El Harmain or some of the, or super Greenland during the winter time, you can find organic ginger. Um, and that, you know, the only downside is like sometimes, especially if it's not organic, they, um, they spray them with a growth inhibitor, um, to, to stop them from germinating or stop them from sprouting. Um, and then what was the question about native plants? Um, can you over winter them, but with native plants, you don't have to do yeah. anything to them, right? Yeah. The, the whole concept. Yeah. Native plants are plants that have been adapted to our region. So they are native to our lands. Um, they, you know, in theory, they are, you know, they thrive in our environment. And so they need less care. They need, you know, they don't need the TLC. It's like the, it's ex the exact opposite of ginger, uh, essentially. And um, when's the best time to plant native plants? It's well, plant, I suppose. yeah, uh, fall is fine. You know, the, the, like if they're like, if you're buying potted plants, um, fall is a nice time to get some potted plants in the ground. And that's, that's actually brings up another thought that I like to recommend people do in the fall time for any perennial is to go out to the garden centers, go out to, um, I, you know, any of the, the big ones like Bordines and Christiansen's or go to, um, what's that one in Dearborn? Um, anyways, English gardens. Oh, English gardens. Thank you. Um, uh, you know, any of those places, oftentimes at the end of the season, they, they do a fire sale on all the perennials because they don't want to overwinter them. So they just try and get a little bit of money for them for whatever they're worth. And they kind of look, they'll look like they'll have all kinds of hostas and, and all kinds of different stuff that look kind of haggard or look kind of rough around the edges. But if it's, if it's a herbaceous perennial, if it's like a leafy thing, it's going to die back anyways. And it'll, you'll probably get a really good price on it and it'll come back nicely the next year. So you can get some really good deals on, on sale stuff. But to answer the question, like, yeah, this is a, a really, this is actually one of the ideal times of year to plant perennials. Um, because uh, there's less stress on the plant um, and because of, you know, there's not the hot weather um, or intense weather. Um, and if you, you know, and they won't grow too much, they won't get, uh, they won't be able to spread their roots out so much, but like if they're living in a pot, they have a little ecosystem going. So, and they're gonna be better off in the ground than in a pot uh, to overwinter anyways, because they have the benefit of thermal radiation and like the, the you know the uh, water and uh, rain and everything for the winter time cool um how often should you till your garden and do you do it every year for cleanup or not as often okay so if, if uh on so to answer me personally, I don't till my garden because it's the, the nature of how my garden is set up. I don't, I just, it, the, um, the beds are narrow. It's not just not ideal for a tiller one. And two, um, I, I've kind of, you know, adopted no till methods. I try to, I, I don't have the weed pressure and, you know, so that's kind of a goal for trying to get a garden set up where you don't need to till all the time. Um, in a general sense, we try to encourage people to till less when you, we, we more, mostly encourage people to till when they're breaking new ground or in some circumstances, if it's a really large garden, you need, like, there's just too much, like there's plant, there's weeds and this and that, um, that you want to till up to start fresh in the spring. But I wouldn't, I would not encourage people to do a fall tilling to till under all of the, the material from the season because you're leaving all that soil exposed afterward. You're basically creating a whole lot of biological activity and leaving the soil exposed. So I would more just say cover all that area, like, you know, cover all that area with leaves and shredded leaves and, and, and mulch and stuff. And then if you, you know, 
if you know you got a till, then wait till the spring to do that. Sometimes at the farm, I know we've, um, when we're putting the farm to bed, we will like rip out the crops and then sometimes don't we use a broad fork <clears throat> and then put compost on top and then put leaves over it or? That would be, that would be another, that, that's fine. That's a reasonable way to do it. Um, it's more work in the fall. So if you got the time now, then, you know, cause we know that spring is gonna be busy in the garden. Like there's so much to do to get the garden up and going and especially on the scale of our farm, the KGD farm. So, you know, so if you know that you have more time at this time of year, then yes, that makes sense. Cool. Um, in nature, the seeds just fall to the ground and reseed in the fall. Why do we need to wait until spring to plant? Well, uh, when you get those volunteers from the things, so like we'll use the dill or the cilantro or the nasturtiums as an example, like those flowers, you know, grew and, and the seed had formed and then some of those seeds fell to the ground. Um, but not all those guys are going to be survivors. Um, and so if you're like, well, I got the time now. I'm going to go throw some seeds out. I'm going to go throw some lettuce seeds out right now. Um, some of those will survive, but some won't. So um, I think, you know, I, I think I appreciate your thinking of like the natural, like how does the natural system work and why, you know, but I, I would, uh, I would more encourage you to like, think about it as those are lucky, like if we get those volunteers from them, yes, we can use those. But if you're intentionally, if you have seed packets, then I would reserve those for, you know, when the time is right. Cool. Um, what should folks do with their herb gardens over the winter? Well, uh, some herbs can tolerate the cold temps and some will even overwinter, parsley being one example. Um, and suburbs won't make it at all. Some are woody and perennial, like sage, will will overwinter year after year, and um, and then basil will die back. Basil's an annual. So, uh, for perennial herbs like sage, you can, uh, I, because it's woody, I would just trim it back a little bit. This you could even consider it just like a like a little bit of a primping and use a, har a harvest of sorts um, or you could do nothing and they'll they'll just sprout you know they'll just get bigger so I, if anything you know a sage plant can get you know two three four feet you know not two three four one two feet you know in a mound um, and you could shape it a little bit you know make it look nice um, uh, and then, oh, uh, so, I mean, basically you're treating, most of them you're treating like herbaceous perennials where you're, unless, you know, it, where you're cutting them down to ground level and then they'll come back next year. Cool. Um, if you had problems with powdery mildew on your squash, is there anything you should do in turning down your garden? to better prevent the powdery mildew next season? Yeah, per, per, well, if you can, removing the leaves and putting them on the curb instead of in your compost pile is gonna help that. But the, the, the unfortunate uh, truth is that um, powdery mildew is gonna come, is a perennial problem. It's just, it, it, it li lives in our environment and it, you will likely have it again but maybe not as bad if you do, you know, if you're doing some management. Sweet. Um, anything you should do when turning down the garden in the fall to help prevent flea beetles in the spring? Remove all things that eat free flea beetles from site. And if you have really bad flea beetles, 
maybe take a year off next year. I know it sucks. It's not a fun idea to think about. A year off of gardening period or? No, a year, a year off of growing those things or some okay. of those things, you know, or move them. I mean, at the very least, try and move them to a whole new location next year. But doing a, a, a really good cleanup is going to be one step in that process. Mm -hmm. Also, you know, there are. I mean, there there would be a cause for, you know, thinking about the ecosystem, like I was talking earlier, there are things that parasitize flea beetles. So like if you're doing, you know, creating home for, homes for um, for those beneficial insects, then that might help managing your pest problems like flea beetles. Okay. Quick uh, clarifying question about herbs. Um, for perennials, you want to cut them back and for annuals, uproot them? Yes. Good point. Thank you. Yes, annuals would be <clears throat> well. So, and then there's annuals that reseed that you might leave. So, so like, annuals would be dill and basil and um, uh, <clears throat> and then for some of the perennials are mint and thyme and sage and uh, things like. That. So, okay. Could you quickly revisit um, the topic of harvesting tomatoes for seeds and just kind of go back over that process right quick? Yeah. So you have a, a ripe tomato of a real, of your favorite tomato variety that you're so excited to be growing the next year and you're, cause your friend gave them to you and, uh, and they were from his grandfather. Um, and so you bring it inside and oh, this is the tomato and you just slice like, you, okay, you know that there's those little chambers inside of the tomato, right? So you slice off the bottom of the tomato, you see, you can see the chambers, but they're all still there. And then you squeeze all that juice and tomatoes into a plastic container. And then you set it on your counter and let it mold for three or four days until it gets some gray mold on it. And then you take a kitchen strainer and you pour that through the kitchen strainer and you rinse it off and you take your fingers and you rub that all that mold and stuff off of the seed. And then you lay, dump that out onto a piece of wax paper, spread them out a little bit and let them dry. And then put that in air, airtight container in a cool, dark and dry place. Make sure you label it with my friend's grandpa's seeds, 2021, and um, then you're good to go. Cool, thanks. Um, Lois, I know you had a question about kale earlier, but I'm sorry, I, I'm not sure in what context it was. So if you wanna um, re-enter it into the chat or unmute to ask it, uh, go for it. Um, we do have, several questions about Brussels sprouts. Um, it seems like some folks had trouble growing it. Um, do you have any tips? Well, Brussels sprouts are difficult to grow. They're a finicky one. Um, they, I would say fertility is one factor. So um, giving them some more nitrogen uh, some source of other source of nitrogen throughout the season. The compost is good, but you could do also like um, some of the liquid organic uh, fertilizers like fish emulsion or kelp, or um, you can get uh, blood meal as an organic uh, nitrogen source. Um, but like adding some fertility is going to help. Um, definitely access to full sunlight. So they want, they, they're, they're hungry. They want lots of sunlight. They want adequate spacing. Um, when it gets late in the season, you can actually remove some of those fan leaves because the, the sprouts, if you're not familiar, the sprouts develop in the um, crotch of the leaf and the stem, they, in that little corner of the, of the leaf and the stem. This is the leaf stem 
and that's where they develop. So you want to give them access, the, the sprouts access to sunlight. Um, and then, you know, and then a regular watering schedule. So fertility, water, sunlight, I think are the biggest, are some big factors there with getting some good development on Brussels sprouts. So, you know, I would say, you know, it's one of those crops that <clears throat> if you have limited space, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it because you're only going to get 20 Brussels sprouts off of one plant at the end of the season. And so it's like cabbage is the same thing. You get one cabbage head, whereas like collard greens, you know, you're going to get collard greens harvest after harvest all season long. So it's just one of those, you know, when you're thinking about what, what you're choosing to grow. I mean, if you love Brussels sprouts, you should definitely grow them, but just uh, an FYI, I guess. Yeah. Um, similarly, how do you make cabbage form ahead? Hmm. If, you know, cabbage usually, you know, they like good fertility too, definitely enough space. So if they're too packed in with other stuff, they might be a little stunted and be, you know, take more time. Um, they are relatively high water content. So you have to do regular watering. Like, you know, a lot of these things will survive. Like you could, you know, you could grow cabbage on a limited water diet and it would be, it would still survive, but it would maybe be tiny and, and not grow much of a head. Whereas like if you're on a regular watering schedule, I'm not saying to like blast your garden with water every day, but like that's, and this kind of keys into like monitoring your garden once a week or so walking through and like having a sense of sticking your finger in the soil and feeling how, how far down it, it's dry and, and planting your, and, and managing your garden based on that, instead of the general recommendation of watering one, one, you know, one good time really well once a week. Um, so if I had to guess it would be, you know, if you want a bigger head, then it would be a somewhat of a nitrogen fertility thing and a water management and a space thing. Cool. Um, could you talk a little bit about how to get a soil test as a garden research program member? Yes. Uh, so we work with a company that we send our, so, well, first off, we want people to be safe. So um, we offer one free soil test to, uh, to all garden resource program members once. So you join this year, you get one test. Um, and if you ever wanna do another test down the road, it's I believe $30. I'm not sure if the price has changed recently. Um, and so how you do a test is to go out in the garden and uh, kind of define a roughly 30 by 30, no bigger than a 30 by 30 area. So, um, you know, um, uh, and, and where, you, where you're actively growing stuff. So if there's grass there, like if it's just, if your garden, if you have two raised beds, then you're just gonna be sampling soil from the two raised beds. Or if you are, um, if you have a 10 by 10 plot, then, then you're just taking samples from that. But if it's a bigger garden, if it's 30 wide and 30, long then you want to be taking samples from that and if it's any bigger than that then you would we would recommend doing a second test so once you've established the area that you're going to be doing your sample from take a gallon a five gallon bucket and a shovel and go out there and you're going to dig that shovel directly into the soil and dig down you know push that blade into the soil uh, six to eight inches lift it up slide it back an inch and do the same thing and then lift that out and in theory you're going to get this kind of thin cake slice of the soil from that spot. If there's any grass on the top of that, remove that, put the soil that you uh, dug up there into the bucket, and then basically do a, 11 others, a total of a dozen random samples around your garden from the areas that you're growing food, not the paths, just in the garden beds. Mix all that together, hom homogenize it, mix it together really well, Remove two cups, dry those out, put them in a Ziploc bag with your name and your contact information. 
And then we have regular drop-offs during, um, which basically it's changed a few times and I'm not sure what the current drop-off protocol is. I don't know if you remember Lola, um, but we would put you in, basically I'm gonna give you Romando's email and you can email him yeah. about, 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 cause he does the soil testing. So it's Romando at keepgrowingdetroit.org and Lola's gonna put that yeah, in the chat. Yeah, just put it in the chat, yeah. Um, so thoughts on putting cardboard down to kill grass to start a new gardening area. Uh, I think it works great. I think it works best when you weigh it down with other things on top of it. Like it needs to be like, you know, cardboard's relatively light. And if it's just that without, right. you can wet it down one, wet it down really well. And then if you can get some compost or some shred leaves or something that's going to help weigh it down and, and, and suffocate that grass underneath is, but uh yeah, that, it's it's a good one. I would definitely recommend it. Cool. Um, do you, you need to put asparagus to bed, or what? What do you do with your asparagus area? Uh, you can cut back all the ferns. Some people leave the ferns up during the during the winter. There is a there is a asparagus beetle, and I'm not sure about its life cycle and if if you're harboring it potentially if you if you leave the leaf, the the you know mature ferns up um so you can cut it all you can cut all those ferns back and and that's essentially it maybe a little bit of, of leaf mulch would be a good idea straw is going to help you know with weed pressure okay um any grow light recommendations Man, you know, it's a whole new era of grow lights and I'm just starting to learn about the LEDs. Um, like the stuff is getting a lot more readily available and, uh, and, and relatively inexpensive. Yeah. Um, we distributed, we had, um, we got some resources to um, get some grow lights for gardens um, last, at the end of last year, beginning of this year. Um, and so we tried out some new LED lights and they, I think there were only 25 or $30 for a three foot long bulb and they have full spectrum and they, they seem to be nice and they, they're supposed to last forever, um, or a really long time. Um, so I think the, the future is LEDs. It seems like, um, uh, and I don't have a particular brand that I would recommend. I still have, um, the shop light style uh, um, fluorescence um, that I usually, that we've been using at home to grow transplants. And those still work fine. Um, you know, we're not, uh, usually we're trying to get the plants to like see, no bigger than teenager size. Um, and so they don't have a like intense light requirements and till about that point and, and then they're going to start to stretch out and really want more light. Um, so on the, on the, like, like there's, those are still a viable option. Um, and I know you can get led shop lights now too, which would be cool spectrum, but that like, even at like home Depot now they have like grow lights, um, that are somewhat reasonably priced. So I would, experiment i would definitely shop around like i think you can find stuff relatively cheap for you know 20 or 30 dollars for a, a decent bulb set so um but I, yeah that's about all i know and i don't have a specific recommendations at this point huh. um someone shared that they have a wild lettuce infestation which is getting worse each year is there a way to mitigate that over the winter Uh, so that's like in the family of, uh, like, um, like the burdocks and the, um, sour docks and like all those deeply rooted, uh, aggressive spreading, uh, per, uh, biennial weeds. So, um, one is to, um, 
prevent seeds seed heads from from establishing and if they're so like you definitely want so there these are proliferating themselves by seed head and then there's um there's a seed bank probably that's existing in the soil so like over time i'm, I'm guessing at your site these they've been growing they've been allowed to grow to flower and then the seed and then that seed went into the air and then it landed on another part of the garden and that's just waiting there for the soil to be disturbed and then it germinates and it grows again so as time goes on you're either um, trying to get those seeds to germinate and then kill them so like you're disturbing the soil at the surface and then and then smothering it or um uh or you're, I mean, it, it kind of falls in the line of, of trying to not till the soil too much. And one of the reasons, going back to that conversation about tilling earlier, we, we try and discourage tilling. One of the reasons that we try and avoid tilling if we can is because there's always a seed, there's always a bank of, of weed seeds in the surface of the soil. And every time we turn the soil over, we're bringing more weed seeds to the surface. And so that could be causing more problems as time goes on. So it, uh, the other thing, I mean, depending on how bad it is, would be digging out the roots um, or just staying on top of them, cutting them back, cutting them back. Cause they're, they have, you know, a, a, a relatively deep tap root, but that's gonna, if you, if you let it sprout and then you cut it back and you let it sprout and cut it back, it's gonna diminish that tap root that, that um, is holding onto the energy um over time so persistence cool um if you use grass clippings in your compost pile will the grass grow back when you uh, lay down the compost no no grass clippings don't have seeds in them um so that's a it's a it's a it's a winner it's a no problem sweet um, thoughts on neem oil, which is touted as a tonic for lots of problems in the garden. I know we use it at the farm. Yeah. Um, there is no silver bullet for everything, um, but you know, neem works for like aphids and it works for some of the pests. Um, so I don't, I, I, it's a good one. I would, I would say, um, uh, Yeah, it's a good one. You want to dilute it, right? Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. pay attention to the, you know application rates and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, yeah. Um, someone shared. I know that you can just turn leaves into the soil in the spring after you cover the garden in the fall, but I'm not clear if the same thing is true of straw. Um, if you use that to cover the beds. Yeah, it works. Um, you want to give it a little bit of time, a couple of weeks between turning it in and planting in that space, but it'll work. If you're growing transplants in that space, it's less of a concern. Seeds are going to be just slightly not as ideal. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and the last question on my list is, can you recommend a good local source for natural fertilizers such as kelp, fish, emulsion, et cetera? or amendments or is there a website that you like to use okay um well i know some of the hardware stores locally have been carrying some of the fertilizer stuff um like granular fertilizer at least organic granular fertilizers like i know that brooks lumber carries some so it's worth checking at some of the hardware stores um because organic is becoming more of a thing, I think the places like English Gardens might carry some of that stuff. There is a place in Troy on Livernoy in like 21 mile or something like that um, called Uncle Luke's that carries, they carry like 50 pound bags of granular fertilizers and, um, and, and all the liquid for, they get a pretty nice selection. Uh, there are lots of, oh, I don't know how I really, um, in terms of online, um, boy, I'm not remembering the name of the place that, there's lots of different options online for 
organic for, I mean, if you're mail ordering it, I don't, I'm sure even Amazon has it these days. Um, not that I would necessarily recommend Amazon, but um, boy, it's like Gardner Supply. Maybe it's just Gardner Supply. Yeah. Um, that name the place. There is, there is a, there. Um, is it that place in New Jersey? Maybe. I've gotten, uh, I got about 10 pounds of diatomaceous earth from them 10 years ago. Uh -huh. it was like it costs more for shipping than the diatomaceous earth costs. I still have lots of it. They have excellent. <laughs> okay. okay. We just might need to. Yeah. That's the downside of it. You're getting like anything that weighs anything that you have to pay it for shipping, but like a bottle yeah, I mean, is only 10 pounds. So, right. But there's just so much of it for 10 pounds. Yeah. Right. The price has gone up because when I've sourced it and looked at it at other places, it's about three or four times that much because it's more popular now. Yeah. Right on. Thanks for sharing, Leslie. Sure. Yeah, Leslie. Um, Tamara's wondering if the herbs that they received from the medicinal class with Lottie will survive outside over the winter. I, I'm, I think those are all native. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think all those things are there. That's their, they, they should be just fine. Okay. Um, any recommendations for dealing with gophers? Gophers. Uh, <laughs> I know gophers and yeah, and groundhogs are tricky. Yeah. Live traps, maybe. Yeah. Malik's, Malik has caught a lot of groundhogs with a live trap and has just relocated them. Yeah. Um, there is a, a repellent spray called Plant Skid, S K Y D D. So hold on. Um, that's made of like coyote urine or something. Or maybe it's two words. Um, that you could spray around the garden, but you know, those things are, they work to some degree, but it's hard to stay on top of them. I would say live trapping is going to be, you know, uh, one of your, uh, most effective methods. Um, uh, maybe a dog, um, yeah. but that's a whole other commitment. <laughs> cool. I think those are all of the questions great okay well hopefully you so hopefully i inspired you guys to go out today or tomorrow and clean up your garden and make it awesome and make it great great awesome plan for next year um i'm definitely going to plan some time getting some time in my garden tomorrow um so i'll be thinking about you guys then and uh and we will see you guys at the next one i will follow up with uh, an email uh, the slides um, sometime this week and, and the video that we're saving from the class today. And we'll see you at the next one. Cool. Bye, y'all. Thanks, Thanks, Lola. Thanks, Thank Keto. you. Thanks, Lola Keto. It's great.